But praise God, it's amazing, you know, we prayed and prayed and prayed. We knew Margaret's life wasn't right. We knew that. We could see that. But we'd been working, caught up so much in our own lives when working with people with addictions, we didn't even realize our own daughter uh, had a drug addiction, you know. And sometimes the devil can do that. He can busy us, make us busy thinking what we're doing is good and we're working for the Lord. And, and yet he gets in the back door in their own families and can destroy them, you know. And we need to be careful. Anybody in ministry here, just be careful of that. You know, protect what we have and our family too, and, and I just to, to move forward. I just want to share with you this morning, you know, one of the gravest miracles God performs on a regular basis is that of a changed life. That of a changed life. You know, did you know that every year around the world, and because of God's grace and God's mercy, do you know there's thousands, if not millions of lives are being delivered and set free from whatever they're they're, they're, they're in bondage too. Why it's addiction, why it's land, why it's thieving, no matter what it is, there's thousands if not millions of lives being set free every year. I think sometimes we, we, we can label things and label a person as a thing, as an addict or as this or as that. You know, we need to realize what God sees it as. It's sin. And we can be set free from the sin in our life. And that's the hope that we give people. Because if you give people labels, they start to believe them labels. And they think, I can't be helped. I'm this or I'm that. So I can't be helped. But when we remove that and see that God can break through in their life. Like Margaret here, you know, most of us have been changed. And, been, and if any of us here are Christians, we've been changed in a way. Because we experience that real power of God in our lives. There has to be a change within us. And that power of God accompanies, accompanies our new life. It's God that does it within us. And you know, one of the greatest, or the primary tools for bringing change in our lives is this book here, the Bible. That's what we have as Christians. That's the gospel. It says the truth sets you free. What's the truth? The truth is God's word. And that's what we can have when we impart our impact into people's lives. We impart the gospel into their lives. You know, and we can ask ourselves, you know, well, what is it about this Bible? What is it about this Bible that empowers lives to be changed in amazing ways? And if you read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it just says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. As we just heard from Margaret there, you know, a Christian life is a changed life. Margaret mentioned the difference in her life and in her family after she got saved. Something was different. Something changed. You see, any of us here, we claim to believe in Christ. And if we continue to live as we did before we believed in him, then we need to ask ourselves why. We need to ask ourselves why. We say we're Christians, but yet nothing changes in our life. Now, the degree and the extent of that change is it's different for each person, but there has to be some change when God comes into their life. Because becoming a Christian requires turning from your sin or turning from your old way of life and turning to God. And that's repentance. We need to turn to God. But repentance is not just a, a, a one time offense. You know, repentance actually defines who we are. It defines the lifestyle of a believer. It makes that change within us. God changes us at the moment of salvation. It's the only thing that is instant in our lives is our salvation. We give our life to God, we're saved. But that's not the end. That's only the beginning. That's only the beginning of a journey that we all go on. But we have to start a journey somewhere. And salvation is the start of that journey. And God does that salvation by imparts something into us. He imparts new life into us. But this, then this is followed by a lifetime of changing into the image of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, it says, And we all, with unfailed face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And I want to share with you this morning from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. So if you have your Bible with you or whatever way you access the gospel, if you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. I'm 
I'll just finish this. It talks about the, the heading at the top of my wee bit is the new life. And first one, he says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, the first is just before this in Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. Paul paints a picture of how believers or how unbelievers lived. Because he says, he says, they live in the futility of their mind, being darkened in, the un- in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And you know, that picture describes each one of us before we met with Jesus Christ. That describes each one of us. But now, in verse 20, Paul draws a contrast to it. And he says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And he gives us a brief sketch of the changed life that every believer should be. And every believer should be, every believer should be experienced. Because Paul says, the changed life stems from the transformation that God works in us through the gospel. And as we put off the old life, we are renewed in our minds and are putting on the new life in Christ. And in verses 20 to 21, Paul shows the changes that God works in us through the gospel. Then in verses 22 to 24, he shows us how the process of change works in our ongoing experiences. And Paul does this in four, four ways. And I'm just going to look briefly at the four ways. First in verses 20 to 21, in the head, and the change life begins by coming to know Christ personally. The change life begins by coming to know Christ personally. And second, the change life requires putting off the old man or woman. And third, the change life requires being renewed in the spirit of your mind. He tells us that in verse 23. And in verse 24, the change life requires putting on the new man. Putting on the new man. So the first point, the change life begins by coming to know Christ. Christ personally. And you'll see there in verse 20, he says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. You see, Paul doesn't say, you did not learn about Christ. That's not what he's saying. He says, this is not the way you learned Christ. This is not the way you learned Christ. And what does Paul mean by that? What does Paul mean when he says to, when he says to learn Christ and see, what he's saying here is he says that to become a Christian is a matter of coming to know Christ personally. And yes, you must know something about who he is. You must know something about Christ. You must know that he's the son of God, and that's good. And yes, you also must know something about the significance of what he did whenever he died on that cross. And he died on that cross as a substitute for sinners. And it's good to know that he satisfied God's wrath towards our sin so that we are free from condemnation. And we trust Christ to save us, we're free from that condemnation. But you know, it's possible to know all these facts and more, yet not know Christ personally. As Margaret says, we were born and reared in East Belfast. And being in East Belfast, I've shared this before, there's only two football teams in East Belfast. In fact, there's only two teams in Belfast, and that's Glen Turn and Glen Turn Saggins. Don't let nobody tell you about these. All their teams that are starting to come through, they don't exist, you know. But I, for, my, for my sins back then, I used to follow Glens on a regular basis, but never missed a match. Not so much now, but then, before God changed me and saved me, I, I, I would have. But every other home match, every other week, they've done a thing in their program. And the centre pages, they would have took a player, a current player who played for the team at that time, and I would have done a profile on him. I would have told you his name, his age, his height, what his favourite food was, his favourite clothes, his wife's name, if he was married, his kid's name, everything, where I told you everything about him. And I could have read that on a Saturday afternoon and come in here and talked about that boy. And he was turning around and said to me, well, you really know that fella? No. I know of him, but I've never met him. I've never met him personally. I know of him. 
And sometimes some people can read this book and know everything in it, but have never met with God personally. They don't have that personal relationship. And that's what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying here, it's possible to know God, but never have met him. It's possible to never, never have met him. You see, the Christian life begins when you receive eternal life from God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul's saying here, that's what he's saying, he says, that's the moment you come to know him personally. As Margaret said, she knew off God, she went to Sunday school and went to different things, but I've never had that personal experience with God. And he won't impose himself on us, he's there for us. But we have to invite him in. See, it's dangerous when we say to people, there's nothing that you need to do. Jesus paid it all on the cross. And that's true to an extent. But we have to accept it. We have to invite him in their lives as our personal saviour. There is something we need to do. Jesus paid the price, but there's something we need to do. First 21, if you read it, where it says, Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And the word assuming, or maybe in some version, it says, if indeed. It's not expressing any doubt. It's affirmation. Paul is saying, I know you've heard of him. Paul's saying, I know you've heard of him. He says in John 8 and 43, Jesus asked the Jews that were challenging him, he says, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. And then Jesus goes on to identify that their root problem, that they were off their father, the devil. Satan had deafened their ears so that they couldn't hear Christ's word of eternal life. They've been deadened to it. And the changed life begins whenever God opens our ears and we can hear Jesus Christ. In the gospel, you'll respond with obedient and faith if we can hear it. And God opens our ears to hear that. And the changed life begins when you're taught in Christ. Whenever you're taught in Christ, and the phrase in Christ sums up Paul's view of what it means to be a Christian. We have to be in Christ. And to be taught in him means to be taught from the point of this new relationship with Christ. Or with Christ. And that entails a new position within Christ. We're a new creation. We're in Christ. See, before we were saved, before Mark was saved, before any of us were saved, we stood outside of Christ. We stood not understanding the things of God. But now, after we're saved, because of God's grace and God's mercy towards us, we're in him for time and eternity. We're in him for time and eternity. To be taught in him is a lifelong process. But it begins at the moment of salvation. It doesn't end at the moment of salvation. It begins at the moment of salvation. And the changed life begins when you know the truth that is in Jesus Christ. And we must live daily in the light of the truth. We must live daily in the light of the truth of what God says that we are now. And do you know what we are now? We're new creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And we as Christians, we need to live each day in that truth. And we do that by putting off the old life. Be renewed in your mind every morning. Put on the new life. And Isaiah chapter 50, I think it is verse 4, the tail end, it says, morning by morning, to hear from the Lord. We need to hear morning by morning. We need to do that. Put off the old self morning by morning. When the great, if the first thing you heard in the morning was God's voice. It wasn't the alarm clock or the traffic or the kids that woke you up. I'm looking around, I'm not going to point for some here, maybe the age of the aches and pains that wake us in the morning. But when the great, if it was God's voice, when the great, they have the answer to the problems before we even knew what the problem was. And only God can do that, but we need to hear from him. And that's what he's saying here. Live each day by that. Put on the new life. What does he mean by the new life? And that's the second point where it says, the changed life requires putting off the old man. And Paul's phrase is literally, the old man or the old woman. He identifies that, he says, in reference to your former manner of life. That's who you used to be. It's not who you are anymore. Put that off. Get rid of that. Get rid of all that you were before you were saved. Because before that you were ruled by evil, your own evil desires and by the world. That's not who we are anymore when we come to know Christ. And Paul says the same in Romans 6 and 6, where he says, Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin 
See, when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. You don't have to go back. You don't have to go back to the world's ways. Paul refers to putting the old man off as an accomplished fact. He says, when Christ died on the cross, we died with him. But he goes on to say, but when he was raised from the dead, we were raised up with him. Praise God. And I believe at the moment that we got saved, we put off the dirty clothes of the old life. We got done away with that. But I also believe that every day we must establish this by putting on everything new. Get rid of everything associated with the old life. Don't let it live in our heads. There's times, there's wee things that we think, well, that's not too bad, I'll hold on to it. No, get rid of it. I'll only open the door to other things. You hear people saying, well, well, you know, it's only a wee white lie. There's no such thing as a white lie. Lies are lie. And a lot of people I would minister to, they don't tell me the truth. They don't tell me lies, but they don't tell me the whole truth. And that's wrong. What he's saying is put everything away. Get rid of everything. And I know even in my life, there are times in my life, I'm still toggling, still that toggling me towards the old life. Sometimes when I see it raising his head, I have to push it down. I have to pray, God, help me with this. Because this was temptation to me. The devil knows what he's doing. I don't want to be that anymore. I'm a new life. I have a new life in Christ. You've brought me away from that. You set me free from that. But there's still times that old tug. And if I'm honest, I don't think I'll be the only one. I said there's more than one here this morning that would feel like that. There's the times we're drawn back to the old life, but we have to get away from it. And the change life requires being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And being renewed means that this is an ongoing process that God performs. God does the changing, but we need to cooperate with him. We need to do our wee bit. Don't sit back and think, well, God will do it all. No, we have to cooperate with him. We have to realize and see what is wrong in our mind. That's why he says, in the spirit of your mind, God does a renewing as we obey him. When you hear that wee voice, the man says, that wee voice, you shouldn't be doing a thing. And you say, I can know, but I'm going to do it anyway. And we need to identify. One of my sins was a gamble that I wasn't very good at. But do you ever, maybe you just don't, but when I was gambling, have you seen a thoroughbred racehorse when it was running? I'd heard many voices. When I heard the voice of the crowd cheering all the horses on, when I heard the voices of all their jockeys on all their horses, but it knew just to listen to the voice of his jockey. And we need to know, we'll, we'll have plenty of opinions and hear voices in our head, and we need to identify, is that my voice? Is that the devil's voice or is that God's voice? We need to know who we're listening to. And the only way we'll realize is that God's voice is if we read his word, if we spend time with him. If you don't hear anybody's voice for a while when the phone you, you're not too sure. You know you recognize a voice, but you can't put a name to it. Why? Because you haven't been talking to him for a while. And you forget. It's the same with God. We can forget if we're not in communication with him. We can forget what he's saying. And the change life requires putting on the new man. See, there's something we have to do. Put on the new man. And I believe at the, at the point of our conversion, we put on this new man or this new woman. But we must continue putting it on. Don't think we do it once and that's it finished. Do it every day. We not, must live by applying the truth of the, of the new man in every situa- situation we face. There's times when, many times that we pray and we say, we tell God about all our problems, which is good. But we come across, I'm facing a big problem tomorrow, or I have a big problem today in the week, or I have this to do, or I have that to do. And we keep praying and telling God about how big our problems are. What about when them thoughts come and them problems come? What about turning and saying and telling their problems how big God is? When the problem comes, you don't say that's a big problem. You say, I have a big God can deal with that problem. No matter how big that problem is. And start telling, that's how we start to live and put off the old self. Before we were in Christ, probably them problems would have consumed us and overtook us and we couldn't have done anything about it and we eventually gave in to it. But that's before we knew Christ. Now we have Christ in our life when the problem comes. It's easy. Easy God can deal with that. It's having that faith and that belief. My God's bigger than that. Why should I worry about that? No matter what Satan throws at me. Remember, we're in the winning side. We're in the winning side. I just want to finish, just in the conclusion, you know, when I look around, there's people here making have had a, a dramatic conversion, as, as Margaret did. Maybe it didn't come from that background as Margaret did. Many of you may have been raised in Christian homes and maybe have come to faith through Christ and sometimes maybe not even remember it's been a process of coming to faith. And that's good and praise the Lord. 
But no matter what you experience or your experience of your conversion, you have to know or you ought to know that God has changed your hearts. Before conversion, we didn't know Christ, but now we do. Now we live for Christ. And to know Christ is that we want to serve him. See, before, before our salvation, we were being corrupted by the evil and the desires that we had to live life the way we wanted to live life. And thinking as Margaret shared that they would bring us fulfillment. Searched everywhere. I was with a guy the other day and he's having part of problems with, with health and stuff. But a whole long story short, he, he went to get physical. He went to do this and went to do that. He named about six things he, 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 he went to do to try and get health for this foot. And the first thing I said to him, have you prayed about it? Well, I said, you're a believer, you're a Christian. Have you prayed about it? No. I said, well, maybe that should be the first thing you do. And then maybe God, if God doesn't heal you, then he'll show you somebody he can. Rather, we, we look at everything else. We exhaust everything else, and it doesn't work, then we pray. And I can be guilty of that too. It's something that we do, but we need to remember, now that we're Christians, we're new creatures in Christ, we live for righteousness, we live for holiness, and that comes from the truth in Jesus. Remember, we have the truth of Christ in our life. Even though it's a, lo- a lifelong process of renewal, you should be able to see, and so should your family. When Margaret could see it, they seen a difference. As Margaret shared in her testimony, she had seen a difference in me when I could see it. There should be that change. You can't profess faith and say that you're different and remain the same. There has to be a change. God is doing a work in and through us. I remember, and I'll just finish with this, I remember reading the book one time. I can't even remember the title of the book or the author or anything about it. But I remember reading, I just wrote it down, it says, I ain't what I want to be. And I ain't what I'm going to be. But praise God, I ain't what I used to be. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, this morning, Lord, that you are God, who not only saves us, but keeps us, Lord. And Lord, we thank you this morning, each one of us here can say, Lord, we're a new creation in Christ. Because of what Christ has done in our lives, not because of what we have done, but by what Christ has done for us. And Lord, we thank you this morning, that, Lord, you, you're, you're still a God that's changing lives, that, Lord, none of us have gone too far. And, Lord, we're all a process. Lord, there's none of us perfect. But, Lord, you want us to strive towards that goal. As Paul says, strive towards being more like Christ. Lord, help us to do that tomorrow. Help us to be a witness in our community, in our homes, in our work, in our families, Lord. Let people be able to say, that boy's different because he met with Christ. Because only you make the difference, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for this time spent in your presence. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, even as we go and we have lunch together, whatever we're doing, Lord. Just want to pray, Lord, you would be glorified in our lives, not just today, but forever. And Lord, we're mindful to give you the glory for who you are. And more importantly, Lord, we give you the glory for who you want to be in our lives. And we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen.